there's an interesting phenomenon going on in our culture right now, in our society right now. We as a culture have really, really bought in to the expert mentality. And what I mean is this. Uh, instead of having our, our kids under our influence and, and we, we are the teachers and primary influencers, we find experts to pass off our kids to. For example, for baseball, uh, you know, if we want our kids to be really, really excelling at baseball, we would set them up with a baseball clinic and a coaching clinic or whatever that looks like and we'll send them to the experts. If our kids are learning piano, there's only so much we can do, so let's send them to the experts and go teach them, to give them a piano lesson. If our kids are uh, learning math and, and getting advanced math and, and we can't help them, we send them to a trigonometry expert, right? If they're failing in math, we'll send them to an expert. The teachers aren't doing it, we gotta send them to an expert, a tutor, if you will. And it's actually seeped into the church a little bit, this idea of expert mentality. As parents, when we come up against something we don't know or we're afraid to direct them differently, we send them to the so-called experts and we drop them off at Awana or drop them off at youth group or, or, or send them to Sunday school. And, and here's the deal. I'm all in favor. If your kid is struggling in math, please hire a tutor. If you want your kid to be better at baseball, yeah, send them to a clinic. But I'm almost positive that that one or two hours a week with the, with the expert, all of the coaches and experts, they have a perceived expectation that you as parents are also working with them, right? You're the ones in the backyard playing catch with them and sending them the form and, and practicing the targets or throwing against the fence, or you're the ones singing songs with them over the piano. You're, you're instilling in them a joy and a love for what they're doing. You're the ones struggling with trigonometry and, and, and scratching your head and trying to remember what the math expert said. They might have one or two hours with your students but you have 10 times that throughout the week. In the same way with the church, we are not the experts. We cannot be perceived as the experts. We need you guys. We might get your kid one or two hours a week, but you guys get them 10 times that. So I understand why the mentality of experts has taken hold, but as Christians, if there's ever a time where we feel like we don't know the answer, we feel like we, we lack wisdom, then we need to, as Christians, ask for wisdom. And James, it talks, talking to Christians, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, ask God for that. And he will give it with generosity. Now, if there's anything more heartbreaking or more joyful, it's raising kids. Isn't it? It's, it's, it's heartbreaking sometimes when we see them make choices that are going to hurt them or other people have made choices to hurt them. But it's so joyful to see them get it right and live in, in such a way that makes you proud to be their mom or dad or, or grandparent or aunt or uncle. So today I want to talk about future parents. Today I want to talk to the, to the parents in the room or, or even the grandparents. Because God provides wisdom through his word. It's the clearest way to have wisdom. And you all are expected to be the experts in passing on the faith to the next generation. So when we're talking about what does the Bible say about being a godly parent, what does the Bible give us encouragement in parenting, it really is helpful to go to the Proverbs, right? There are so many little nuggets of truth that are memorable and encouraging. And one of those nuggets is Proverbs 22, 6, where it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. It sounds really nice, right? But we still have to unpack that a little bit. And in order to understand the Proverbs for parents today, we need to understand parents in Proverbs Day. Because when it says train up a child in the way he should go, what does that mean, train up a child? Does that mean that we should send them out to the experts? I would argue that it's not. <laughs> I would argue that the responsibility to train up the child in the way he should go falls on the parents. Throughout the Old Testament, we see parents as the primary teachers for all things spiritual, moral, and societal. If you have your Bibles, open up to uh, the book of Genesis. And, and, and if not, it's okay. I'll just read it. I got them marked here, so I want to read it. Just to illustrate this point that the, the parents throughout the Old Testament are the primary influencers, the ones training up the child, children on the way they should go. Check out 
Uh, Genesis 18, verse 18, if you're there, well, if you're fast, uh, it says, Abraham is to become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will command his children and his house after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and what is just. Abraham was chosen because he, God wanted him and knew that he would be able to pass on to the next generation. And because of that, Abraham's diligence in passing on the faith, a whole nation began and a whole religion began. Another example is in the book of Exodus. Uh, a whole other different type of example, but in Exodus chapter 12, verses 24 and 25, it says, Keep this commandment permanently as a statute for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, you are to observe this ceremony. When your children ask you, what's the ceremony mean to you? You are to reply, it's the Passover. Sacrifice to the Lord, for he passed over the houses of Israel. Of, of, of Israel. So that, that is talking about like this, this big idea of this is a big memory, right? This is part of the society. This is part of our traditions, and it's the parents' responsibility to pass that on. Another example is in Deuteronomy 6, chapter 6. And it's the, the famous verse is called the Shema, where it says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. This idea that, that parents are the primary teachers, they're responsible, they're responsible for passing and teaching on their children about righteousness, we saw in Genesis. They're responsible for teaching about faith traditions, which we saw in Exodus. They're responsible for even teaching their children about having a relationship with God, learning what it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, later on added. Uh, they're talking about it in the morning, in the evening, while walking, while sleeping, in a house with a mouse, in a box with a fox. It's like totally Dr. Seuss right there. But parents are the ones responsible to train up a child in the way they should go. That's that first part that I really want to hammer home, that it's the parents that are responsible, that are the primary teachers. And in Proverbs, even when we come to our Proverbs, many of the sayings are the father's wisdom passed down to a child. In Proverbs chapter 1, 8, Proverbs 4, 1, Proverbs 4, 6, Proverbs 6, 20, all of them start with this idea of listen, to my, listen my son, to a father's wisdom. Right? All of these proverbs are actually written for the children to hear and to take on that training up in the way they should go. Because parents are the primary influencers, primary teachers for the spiritual things in life, they are the ones that help their children find the wisest way. In other words, you could say that the faith walk that the parents show influence where the kids will go. The faith walk that the parents show influence where the kids will go. And here's how they influence that. If the parents are the ones that the, are the primary teachers, their faith walk is what will show that. What does the way mean? Train up a child in the way he should go. What is the way he should go? Well, in the Hebrew here, that word way actually has two different uh, meanings. In, in the Hebrew tradition. Two different types of meanings. One of them uh, could, could mean that train up a child in the way he should go could mean that training up, the, excuse me, the word could mean the best way for that specific child. Taking into account the temperaments, taking into account the strengths, taking into account the weaknesses. So as parents, who are the primary teachers, the, to train up the child in the way he should go means that no child is the same that no youth is the same. And you need to find, as parents, the best way to influence your child and show them the way. Whether that means they're introverted or extroverted, whether that means you can't just take a, a book about parenting and apply it directly to your kid, because that could really mess up your kid. Maybe the author of this book is writing to, uh, the, the author of the parenting expert book 
might be writing to a totally different temperament. And if you took that and didn't contextualize it and didn't realize that your kid has a specific way that he needs to be parented, you could truly do some damage. So that's one way uh, that that word is explained. That each child is different. The other way that the word, the way, could be explained is that it's the wisest and most godly way. Train up a child in the way he should go. In the way meaning, how is he going to meet God and grow closer in a relationship with God? Which way is that? And I would submit that you could probably apply both of these meanings to this parenting verse of Proverbs 22, 6. To train up a child in the way he should go. This idea that training up that child based on their temperament and strengths and weaknesses, but also training up that child to follow Jesus with all of their heart, strength, and mind, and soul. It's kind of a big task, right? And it really works best when parents are modeling that, and not just, not just telling them what to do. But And, and even as Christians, I think that let me back up a bit. Even as Christians, the wisest way to live, right? Going back to that second meaning of the way. As Christians, the wisest way to live would probably look as close to how Jesus lived as possible. That word Christian literally means little Christ. And we are to be following in the way of Jesus as best we can, both in his relationship with the Father and, 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 and his parents modeling that, that you have a right relationship, you're praying constantly and, and, and studying your Bible all the time. And, and it also means loving the neighbor as ourselves, loving others as ourself. And as parents and grandparents, we can model that behavior and just take for a couple examples. We can take compassion. Jesus truly lived a life of compassion. I, I believe that when Jesus is walking down the road and he sees somebody who's blind, he can't help but help them. He is so full of compassion. He could be in the middle of a sermon and a roof could open up and a lame man can come down and he has compassion on him. He cannot help but live that out. And because he couldn't help but live that out, we are also able to model that. Because he was able to model that, we are able to follow in his footsteps. And even in, later on in the book of Colossians, Paul is talking to, to Christians and saying, you need to put off the old way of life. Put off the old self. In Colossians 3.12, he says, Put off that and put on compassion. If you want to be a Christ follower, first have that right relationship with Jesus, but don't let it end there. Then go live it out and put on compassion. We need to model that. And you can model that through serving together, going to the rescue mission together, making a meal for a, a newborn family or someone who's sick. There are all sorts of ways that, that families can model compassion, even how you respond to the panhandler. Your kids are watching. They're watching you. And remember, the faith walk that the parents show influence where the kids will go. Another example of living a wise way in today's culture is living with humility. We are constantly being pumped up by ourselves and, and, and saying we have to look out for number one and we're going for that promotion. But as Christ followers, we are to model humility as Jesus modeled humility. Philippians 2.5 says, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, this attitude of humility. Because although Christ existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself and became man. And taken the form of a bondservant, he was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus modeled humility. He constantly put others first. And his parents, if you want your kids to be humble, if you want your kids to be compassionate, if you want your kids to see what living a godly life looks like and having a right relationship with God, you need to model that. Because the faith walk that the parents show influence where the kids will go. Now that last part of Proverbs 22.6 Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. A lot of flack has been given to this verse because people treat it like a promise. And unfortunately, we as parents can be doing everything right. We as grandparents could do everything right in modeling what a relationship with God looks like. But unless God, unless 
unless the child responds to God's reaching love, what can we do? I'm an example of someone who wasn't raised with a what a relationship with God looks like. My family's still not Christian today. Yet I want to constantly live my life and pass on the relationship of, with Jesus to my family. I'm starting a new tradition. And I see as a, as a youth pastor now, for a long time, I've seen two ways that this can go about. This idea of this train up a child in the way it should go. One way is the parents take the stance of do as I say, not as I do. Because they don't have that right relationship. They're full of lukewarm Christianity. Do as I say, not as I do. Maybe they're not even Christians. And they send their kids and drop them off at the experts. But that kid could get totally sold out. And I've seen this happen before. In high school years, I've seen kids come and to our group and be a student leader, help lead worship, truly heartfelt worship, go on every mission trip provided. Some kids have been on five mission trips, uh, go to every camp, every retreat. Yet when they go off to college and temptation comes or, or when they go back home, they fall right back into the same mold that their parents have, have set. Or because the parents didn't have a stable relationship with Jesus, the kids fell right back into that model and mentality. A better way might be to practice what you preach as parents. I can think of other kids who have been a part of this group, who have been on some mission trips, who have been on some service projects, who, who, who maybe weren't student leaders, but their house, their parents were the primary influencers. They didn't expect the expert to fix their kid, like in the previous example. And they modeled what it looked like. And I see them growing up today, and they have kids now, and they come to our church, and, and it's beautiful. There's so much joy. Remember, there's so much joy in parenting, but there's also so much heartbreak that can take place. And unfortunately, this is not a promise that's been given to us. But it is a wise way to live. Because although these Proverbs are not promises, over the years, time will tell and time will show that the faith walk that the parents have, totally messed that up, the faith walk that the parents show will influence where the kids will go. And it's not a promise, but over time you have to realize your influence is so mighty as parents. And when you lack wisdom, go to God and seek wisdom. I'm praying for you guys. Let's pray right, even right now. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the wisdom that is gleaned from it. And thank you that it is so clear at times to, to, to seek advice and to seek what we should be doing as parents, as grandparents, as future parents. Lord, I pray that we will uh, run to you, run to your word when we are baffled by our kids. And Lord, I pray that you will continue to give us discipline to model what a right relationship with you looks like, to model forgiveness, to model confession, to model humility, to model compassion. And Lord, I pray that as our kids are watching, that we'll bring them along into uh, the way that we are living as we strive to live closer and closer to you. Thank you for your word in your son's name. Amen.